This is the next in the series of object-oriented development for MQL4 and I'm going to build a dashboard because I've had a number of requests for dashboards. Uh, the dashboard I'm building is quite simple. It's entirely text-based and I have one running here on screen to show how it might work. Uh, this is a an example that I just put together quickly. Um, I have a, an arrow at the top of the screen that changes color and direction depending whether the current price is above or below the opening price for the bar. I'm running this on a one minute chart at the moment, I'm showing the current bid and the ask price. Then I'm calculating the spread and you'll notice that the color of the spread description changes depending whether it's above or below two. Um, and then I've got seconds to the next bar. Um, also, every time the bar changes, the entire block moves down slightly until it gets to a point down here on the screen somewhere where it will then move back to the top. Um, that serves no useful purpose, it's just to demonstrate one of the features of the dashboard. So let's get into building this dashboard and the first things we need to consider are what would be the essential elements of a dashboard like this. Now I'm concentrating only on the presentation here, the content is entirely up to you. There is an example program which is the uh, indicator that I have running here that I'll share but you may want to display entirely different things. So the key features of the dashboard itself in terms of presentation obviously distance from the top of the screen which is the thing that I'm changing every time the bar moves. Um, then for each line we have text or rather there are then a m number of lines in the there we go, it's gone back to the top. There are a number of lines in the dashboard. Each line has text, font, size, and color. Uh, and then because each of these, they're actually drawn as a text object on screen, so they're independent lines, and each one of them then has their own distance from top of the screen. So now let's go to the code and see how we might build that. All right, on screen, I've just used the wizard to create a simple dashboard class again, uh, but I have made my usual changes to the format, the layout, and we'll go from here to create the code that we need. First thing, as I said, each row has a number of properties to it. I could create the row as a class um, and that will be a useful exercise but possibly for some time in the future. For now I want to keep the dashboard class itself simple. So I'm just going to create a struct to hold the values that are on each row. So this is my dashboard row structure. Uh, the values that I'll actually set, I'll set the text of each row, the color, the font and the size but then I'm going to calculate two values for each row again. Uh, the Y size is the actual size in pixels on screen, which doesn't exactly match the font size. And the Y distance is the vertical distance from the top of the screen for that row. Next, I'm going to set up the private variables that I'll use for the dashboard. So the member variables that I have I'm creating an array of rows, which are of the type dashboard row, which is the structure that I built. Then my dashboard has a name, and I'm using this because it's possible to create more than one object of this type. Uh, and if you wanted to display two dashboards on the screen, they need to have separate names so that they can be addressed because of the objects drawn on screen. And then the Y distance is the distance from the top of the screen to the beginning of the dashboard. It's not the same as the Y distance to each row, although it would be the same as the distance to the top of the first row. Uh, but this is to create a base distance for the entire dashboard. Next, I'm going to need a number of functions, basic functions to operate. So I'll create those here. And you might notice I'm using the private here twice. Uh, that's perfectly acceptable and I often do that for readability. So here I've used private for member variables only. Now I'm creating private functions. Uh, it has no impact on the way the class operates. It's just for readability. 
So the first thing I want to do is create a simple function that creates the text object name. Each row inside the dashboard is a text object on screen and I need to have a name to be able to find that on screen in MetaTrader. So I'm passing in an index to that and then all I'm doing to calculate a standardized name is I'm using the name that I've applied to the dashboard and the index number separated with an underscore. And I'm setting that up as a standard function because I like to do that for anything that might be used more than once in an application. That way I'm consistently using the same value. Um, calculate the row Y distance. So this is to calculate this Y distance value on a single row. Set the row Y distance. That will set the value of the Y distance inside the row variable or inside the dashboard row array. Draw row is just going to draw the text on screen uh, using the values that are in the structure. And delete all is used to clean up the entire array of rows. Um, it will delete all of the elements of the M rows array and also delete any objects on screen. The next step will be my public initializers. So let me paste these in. I've left this here just to indicate that I am not using the default constructor. Uh, so the default constructor was placed there by the wizard, but I want to make sure that when this object is created, it has the essential elements of a name and a Y distance. So by removing that default constructor, it's impossible to just create a new C dashboard you must create C dashboard passing in the name and the Y distance. Um, and as my usual habit, um, I'm not doing anything with these values inside the constructor. I'm passing them directly to an init function. Uh, and the destructor will call this delete all function defined above. And then of course I've created the init function to take the name and the Y distance. And the body of that function is a little further down. Also, because I've done that, I've fully written the C dashboard and destructor for C dashboard here. So I need to remove those from the body here. Next, I want to be able to set the values of the text, the font, etc. on screen. So I'm going to create some create, read, update and delete functions. Um, firstly, to add a row, I obviously need the text, the color, the font, and the font size for that row. Then to read the values of those, um, and I won't be using these functions today, but uh, they are useful functions to have. I've simply added get row text, color, font size, and the Y distance, passing in the index of the row. And again, as my usual habit, if it's a single line function, as these are, I often write them inside the class description rather than move this function further down. Um, that's entirely up to you. This is just for style. Then I have the update functions where I can set the row using the index, the full text, color, font, and size. But typically in an application like this, you would set the color, font, and size once and the and then update the text on a regular basis. So I also have a function that just sets row text, taking the index and the text. Uh, finally, um, and we won't really be using this either in the application today, but removing a single row or a series of rows, passing in the first and the last index. Uh, if you wanted to remove a single row, then obviously last would be the same as the first index. And the last of my class definition, uh, I have a number of standard properties. Get name will return the name of the dashboard. The Y distance will return the, again, the vertical distance from the top of screen to the top of the dashboard and set the Y distance. This is what I've been using in the example where the entire dashboard was moving down slightly and then eventually moved back to the top, uh, set the Y distance of the int value. Um, these simple one-line functions, but the set Y distance is more complex 
and the function for that will be below. Now let's create the bodies of some of these functions. Uh, the first will be the init function. Let me paste in some code. The constructors I don't need because they're fully defined above. The init function takes name and y distance. So all I'm doing here, the name is just being assigned to the member variable name. Then just in case objects have been left on screen from a previous iteration of this, uh, I'm calling the delete all function that will clean up the array and find any objects on screen that might be orphaned from a previous run. And then I'm setting the y distance. The reason I'm doing this after the delete all, because the y distance will actually move objects on screen. And if there are any left, I just want to get rid of them before I set the y distance. It's not really needed on the init because there should be no rows, but I'm using a consistent approach and I'm always going to call the set y distance function rather than just set the variable my distance. Now the bodies for the general functions that I defined, paste these in. All right, general functions. Uh, calculating the y distance. Um, I should wrap this around so it's a little easier to read. All I'm doing here, I'm saying if the index for the row that we're trying to calculate the y distance for is zero, so it's the topmost row, then the y distance for that row is just the y distance for the dashboard. Otherwise, it's the y distance of the previous row, so m rows index minus one, y distance, plus the y size, which is a calculated value, and we'll see that later. So the distance of the top, the row above, plus the size of the row above, plus two, and two is just a gap that I'm placing between lines, um, and I'm just using a constant there. The set row y distance, so if the index has been passed in, and I use this regularly through the application, you'll see soon. Um, I'm just going to set the y distance, not only for the row where the index has been passed in, but also for every row after that, because obviously as one row moves, all the other rows below it need to move. So I'm simply using the calc row y distance function um, as I ripple through from index until I get to the last row, um, the y distance, and then if that distance is different to the current y distance of the row. Um, so there's no point in redrawing a row if it's already in the correct position. So if the calculated y distance for a row is different to the current y distance, then I'm simply updating the array value and redrawing that row. And as soon as I get to a row where the y distance is equal to the current y distance, there's no need to go any further. So I have this else condition and I'm just breaking to get out of that loop. Now, the draw row function. This is very important to the placement of the text on screen. Um, firstly, every object on screen has a name and I'm using the text object name function, which was defined earlier. Um, and you'll remember that this is simply the concatenation of the dashboard name with the index number. So first I try to find that object on screen. Uh, this object find function will return a negative number if the object doesn't exist. And if it does not exist, then I'm just going to create it. Uh, the object create function takes the name, the type of object, which in my case is a label, um, and then some positioning values that are not needed for this, but they have to be passed to the function. Then I'm taking the current y size. So the row already exists before I'm calling this draw row function. I've already created it in the array. That's why I'm able to just pass the index. So I'm checking the current y size. Remember, y size is the size in pixels of the row. It's not the font size. So I'm capturing that here in case it changes as a result of this draw function. Then I'm setting the text for the object name to the text of my array with the size, which is the font size, the font name, and the text color. This is a standard MQL function. After that, I need to place it in the correct position on screen. I'm setting the corner. 
uh, there are four corners as defined for the object set ob -trop, for the obj prop corner um, and they are I'll scroll across to the right zero is top left one is top right two is bottom left and three is bottom right now I could have built this dashboard to allow you to set the corner but I'm trying to keep it simple and in a future video we'll go through some of the features that we can add to this to make it more flexible but for the time being uh, I'm keeping it at the top right and when we get back to seeing this on screen I'll explain why I've chosen that position. The x distance is distance from the right hand margin because this is in the top right corner x distance is measured from the right hand side of the screen and I'm just setting this to 8. Um, it just seems like a reasonable value to keep it away from the side of the screen. And finally the y distance is the y distance of the row which you'll see the calculation soon. Uh, and this places the row vertically from top of the screen. Once I've done that I'm getting the new y size which is an obtrop a call to object get integer using obtrop y size. This is because the font size isn't the same as the number of pixels on screen um, and there isn't even an exact formula because different fonts have different sizes. So once I've drawn the object on screen, which I've done with these rows, I can then ask MetaTrader to tell me how big this object is on screen. So now I have a new Y size for this piece of text, which sometimes returns zero. So I'm just checking. As long as I got a value greater than zero for the Y size, then I'm going to set the Y size of my array row. If I did get a value of zero, then I need to make sure I do at least set a Y size. So if my row currently has a Y size of zero, I'm just going to default the Y size to the font size multiplied by this default calculation, which roughly calculates pixels compared to font. Um, this should happen for only a very brief time. Um, the next time through it's probably going to be picked up because the Y size should come back as non-zero. But just in case when it's first created and we get a Y size of zero, I will at least have a default size here. Then I'm also saying that if the size when we came in here, which could be zero if it was a new object, or it could be the size we calculated earlier, if that size has changed from the new size that we calculated in this block then it means that this row is now bigger or smaller and what I need to do at that point is change all of the the Y distance of all the remaining rows they either need to ripple up the screen or ripple down the screen depending how the size of this row has changed so I'm calling the set row Y distance function um, and the set row y distance function also redraws each row after it changes the y distance. We saw that here. It calls the draw row function, um, which is going to cause a cascading loop. But because we're always going from index minus one, uh, I know this is a sloppy piece of coding, but it's not going to be used frequently and it's an easy way through. Um, this can be one of the enhancements that we add in when we look at modifications to these functions in the future. Finally, my delete all function. Um, it just does delete rows, uh, the function that we saw earlier, which begins with row number zero for all of the rows in the array, and then calls the standard function objects delete all, looking for everything mname underscore, which is the beginning of the name of each of those objects placed on screen. Now to the create, update, and delete functions. Add those in. Create functions. Add row. Um, at this stage, I'm requiring that add row passes in text, text color, font, and size. This is another enhancement we can make later to create overloads for that. Um, but at the moment, passing all four of those values in, first thing I want to do is know how big the current array is because I'm going to add one more row to the array which I do here with the array resize 
and index now is the pointer to that new last row of the array. Uh, then I'm simply setting the values in the array, text, text color, font, and size. That's passed in. And then I'm calling the set row y distance function, which you've already seen. And then I'm calling draw row. So row y distance will set the dot y distance value of that element and draw row will set the dot y size value as we saw above. The set row function, just setting all of the individual values for an existing row. So I need to pass in the index and then all I'm doing for that index, um, setting the text, text color, font and size. Now you probably noticed I have no error checking here to see that index is a valid value. Um, again, that's something easy enough to add. I just haven't bothered to do it here. We'll probably add it in a later video where we enhance this further. Once these four values have been set, I can just call the draw row. None of these will have changed the Y distance of this row because that's set by other rows in the dashboard, but they may change the Y size and that gets calculated in the draw row function. And then the set row text is a cut down version of set row where you may simply just want to set the text and this is quite common. So all I'm doing setting the text, calling draw row, which I know will recalculate the Y size, but it's a minor overhead. Set Y distance. This is where you want to reposition the vertical distance of the entire dashboard. All I'm doing there, set the Y distance to the value passed in, and then by setting the row Y distance of the first row, index zero, this will ripple all of the other rows up or down the screen, depending how you've set the Y distance. So go back to the definition of the set row distance. You'll see here, not only do we set the distance for the row passed in, but then it ripples through every other row and updates until it has no need to change. Let's go back down. Here I have the delete rows function. I'm passing in the first row to be deleted and the last row to be deleted. So a quick check. If the last row is greater than the array size, then I'm just setting it to be the last row in the array. And if the first is less than zero, then I'm setting that to be zero. Um, also, if the last row is less than the first row, I'm just returning with no work done. Now this is maybe not the most efficient function, but it shouldn't be used too often. It may cause a quick flicker on screen if you use it. Um, I don't think it's going to be a problem. So I'm just making a simple function here. First, I'm creating an array of rows of type S dashboard row that I'm going to use as a temporary copy of all the rows that I have. Then I'm simply copying everything from M rows into rows using a loop. Um, then I'm removing all of the text from the screen using objects delete all and passing in the prefix of that information, which is the name and the underscore. Then I'm resizing M rows to zero just to remove everything that's in the current array. And in the last step, I'm going to copy things back from rows into M rows. So I'm looping through from zero to the size of the rows array, but I'm skipping rows, so only if I is less than the first row to be deleted or greater than the last row to be deleted. So I'm skipping over that interval that we're trying to delete. And for all the other rows, I'm just using the existing add row function to add them back into the M rows array. That takes care of putting the rows onto the array, uh, redrawing them, resizing and setting their Y position on screen. So it's reuse of an existing function, although perhaps not the most efficient way to remove a few rows from the array. That's everything in the class. Let me just do a compile on this quickly. That's fine. Um, so now we have the class. What I want to do next is just create an indicator, which is the indicator that I was showing earlier, um, to do a quick demonstration on screen. So here I have the dashboard example that I've created. Um, standard features to begin with, comment block, properties. Uh, this is in the indicator chart window, which is the main window. I'm including my 
dashboard.mqh file and now I'm defining a variable of variable dashboard of type C dashboard. In on init I want to create a new C dashboard. I'm just calling it test and I'm setting my vertical distance to be 15 to begin with. Uh, that's 15 pixels on screen. Then I'm adding five rows. I'm not putting any text here in the add row because it's going to be overwritten fairly soon below. Uh, so I'm just setting five rows all to font to Homer of points of um, font size 12. Um, in case, or well, on D init, I simply want to delete the dashboard variable because this has been created with a pointer. If I don't do this, then I'll be using up additional memory inside MetaTrader. Um, and then I'm refreshing this dashboard on every calculate. So every tick, I'm going to refresh the dashboard. So at the beginning, um, this is the loop that moves the dashboard down the screen. So every time I get a new bar created, so I'm checking my current time, if that's different to time zero, then I'm just moving the dashboard down by five each time there's a new bar created. Uh, but if, my, if I'm already moved down by 50 or more, then I'm just going to bring it back to the top. So that's just to demonstrate a feature of the dashboard. First row that I'm setting on the dashboard, if you might remember, was an arrow that shows whether the price is going up, down, or sideways. All I'm doing is comparing the close for the current bar with the open. So if the close is above the open, then I'm creating an up arrow, which in the Wingdings font is a character 233. Um, and so I'm drawing a blue up arrow if the close price, current price, is greater than the open price. Uh, and because I'm setting not only the text, but also the color font, I'm using the full set row function. Uh, if the close is below the open, then the price is going down. So I'm using a down arrow, which is a 234 uh, colored red. And if the close price is currently the same as the open price, then I'm doing a sideways arrow, which is a character 232 in white with wingdings. Uh, that was the first line. Let me just put a gap here. Then I'm displaying the bid and the ask prices. And I have no need to change the font or the color or the size for those. So I'm just using string format, bid, colon, and percent font dot 5f will give me a floating point value with five decimal places. Uh, so I'm showing the bid and then the ask. And they, they are in rows number one and two. Then I was displaying the spread. So first I'm calculating spread simply as ask minus bid, um, but scale depending on the power. Now I'm assuming, because my broker uses five digits, that all brokers use five digits. If you have a broker that's still running a four digit number, you may want to change this, but for most currencies, this will calculate spread in points or pips. Um, then I'm simply putting a condition here if current spread is greater than two, which is working fine for my demonstration at the moment on Euro US, but different currencies will have different spreads. And all I wanted to do was demonstrate that if I've got a large spread, I can display in one color. And if the spread is lower, I can change the color to something else. So row number three, I'm displaying the spread with one decimal place, um, yellow, and I'm using the courier font and size. I should have set both to the same size. Um, I'm setting the font to courier, color yellow, if the current spread is below two, and green, no, sorry, yellow, if the current spread is above two, and green, if it's below two. Um, and finally, seconds to next bar, and I'm just calculating the number of seconds until the next bar crew happens and again I'm just setting row text because I don't need to change fonts or colors there so I can compile that if I and that worked and now we can go over to the chart and just see it operating All right so we're on the chart now and the spread on the euro US has narrowed so I've actually modified the 
application I'm not uh, changing the color of the spread on uh, two points I'm changing it now at uh, two tenths but let me just add this and we just watch carefully as I add it you'll see that because the sizes of the rows are set after they're drawn you'll see when this first appears that it's compressed and then grows fairly soon after that there and we can see this is a one minute chart currently and we've just created a new bar so time, seconds to the next bar has gone back up spread is above three now it's below so the color is changing there uh, the bid and the ask prices are updating and the indicator arrow is showing whether the current price is above below or the same as the open price for the bar so the values in here are entirely up to you this has been an example of how to create the presentation of a dashboard um, there are no graphics other than the use of windings for this arrow um, this actually is a dashboard or a minor variation of a dashboard that I still use very often for clients where they're more interested in the information displayed rather than the presentation and I find that's quite common uh, as long as people can see this. In future videos we'll fix some of the shortcomings of this so error handling and some of the improvements to usability and then we can move on to look at a more feature rich dashboard um, and how that can even be used on a VPS so that you don't need to be logged in to the MetaTrader that's running your experts to see the values. Um, I hope this has been useful to you. If it has, please leave a like and a comment. They're always welcome. And remember to subscribe and click the bell icon to be notified when we produce more of these videos. Thank you very much for watching.